Welcome to another edition of Sunday Night Football with Bengal Jam and Friends. And as usual, we got James on here from uh, Brownsburg, Indiana. And we got our buddy from up north, from Milk River, Alberta. Hey, Canada. all right. That sounds- that's like, that's real close to Montana, dude. That's really far from you, right? <laughs> yeah, that's not even close. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go swimming there, though. It sounds pretty good. Yeah. Good Milk trip. River. Good fishing. Oh, man. Hey, uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, great lineup tonight. Um, exciting week uh, this past week, right? So we've had a lot. I think we had four of the rookies that have signed. Uh, the big dog, Joe Burrow, don't don't be scared. He's going to sign this week. I expect him to sign within the next day or two. Uh, so very excited about uh, getting those rookies signed and, and get them in camp. Uh, I was downtown doing some walking this weekend uh, and today and saw some of the players kind of going in. And out. I think they did their COVID testing. Uh, that they got taken care of. And then there were some uh, physical exams they also uh, did as well. So uh, I would expect, fully expect to see Joe Burrow within the next day or two sign. So so what's going on, guys? How was the weekend? Um, what's going on? All good. It's a gorgeous weekend here in uh, central Indiana. You can see him sunburn from uh, today at the uh, at the pool. But, um, you know, it's baseball started, which we talked about last week. Um, seems to be going smooth. So hopefully that means uh, good things for football. As you mentioned, guys checking in, um, rookies getting signed, tests done. You know, what is it, a couple negative tests they need. And, you know, everything's moving forward. So um, getting excited. Good. Yeah, same as me from last week, just slinging poutines and mac and cheese up here in Canada <laughs> during the shutdown. Um, I'm anxious, obviously, for sports. To, I, I'm not I'm not a big baseball guy. Like, I, I do follow. I do watch. I'm finding the, the lack of the crowd thing really takes away from the game for me. It's, it's odd, man, watching it. But I'm excited about NHL starts next weekend. So I'm excited to see how that plays out. So. Yeah, that's funny. When we were we were downtown today, walking around, and the Reds game started early afternoon, so I could literally go to the front gate. I could see some of the players from a distance. Uh, so actually, got to see into this into the stadium a little bit. Reds went down today, by the way, uh, three to two. Um, but uh, so the lineup tonight, guys, uh, really cool. Very excited about uh, having Mister Everything, not just a punter, not just a receiver. But we're going to talk about his quarterbacking ability here today as well. Pat McAnally, uh from Harvard University. We'll talk to, to Pat. Uh, we have a fan of the week, uh, Josh from um, West Palm Beach, Florida, joining us. And he also runs a huge Facebook uh, group as well for uh, Bengals fans. We'll talk about that here a little bit as well. And on our History 101, uh, Tom, Justin, and I will kind of dig into training camp discussion. Uh, we're going to go back to the beginning in 1968 where Paul Brown picked uh, – you know, um, not Georgetown, but Wilmington College and some of the funny training camp stories we have about that. So Tom and I will go back and forth with some interaction on on training camp since it's, we're getting to that time. So and question of the week may or may not happen. Pat uh, said he was OK, giving us more than than 20 minutes today. So we're going to give uh, take as much time as Pat will allow us to have. We want to respect his time. But, man, I'll tell you what, I we have uh, sent some messages to his former teammates and as if I didn't have enough stuff to talk about, guys, we got some really good stuff to talk we, about, uh, about today. Loaded for bear tonight. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> so I did. I did. I, I was texting Pat about an hour ago. So um, I know he was trying to. He kind of knew what he had to do to get on. He's not in the room yet, I assume. Yeah. Is he? Okay, yeah. good. Well, I tell you what. Let's guys. Let's get it going, man. Let's get. Yeah. Let's jump right into it. So as we're going through this, so if we do knock off our question of the week at the end of the show. Uh, we're going to leave some time for you guys to be able to interact uh, with Pat, ask questions to Pat, and we'll funnel those through through Jamie here. But um, 
we, we're excited to have Pat. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and bring on Pat McAnally. Hey. Hey, Pat. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, man. It's sunny and nice out here in California. It's, it's sunny and nice in Cincinnati right now, Pat. Nice. See? <laughs> actually sunny in Canada. Canada. So, so Pat, Pat was drafted in, uh, out, of the, out of fifth round, 1975, from Harvard. Played with the Bengals through, uh, I think, the 85 season. He was a pro bowler and an all-pro in 1981. He was enshrined in the College Football Hall of Fame in 2016. Jane, I want to make sure my, my volume okay, my mic. Yeah, you're good. I think I was catching some of the replay on the delay. Okay. You're good. And, and then, um, you know, he, Pat was also the first Harvard grad to play in either the NFL, Pro Bowl, or Super Bowl, and did that both in 1981. So, punter and receiver. And, Pat, we're just going to get right into a, a, a quick film clip here. We're going to ask you. So, you're not just a punter, not just a receiver, but I think you threw some passes. If you could go ahead and play clip one, Jamie. These all ratings have been dismal so far, but punter Pat McAnally and co-stars pulled out all the stops, hoping to notch their first win of the season against the visiting Rams. A fake punt helped the Bengals tie the game, but with his father, Congressman Canelli faked a punt and found rookie running back Stanford Jennings with a short pass. A 34-yard gain helped set up the first of two short so, so Pat, not only you were a punter or a receiver, but you had a 75% completion percentage passing, Pat. Yeah, and Stanford dropped the last one. I should have <laughs> my career. And by the oh, way, man. I think those plays are more important than what Stanford did in that Super Bowl. Yes, exactly. Those are way bigger plays. <laughs> exactly. So, Pat finished his, his passing career, three for four passing, 81 yards. Those two plays were from 84. 75% completion percentage. I'm sure Kenny Anderson was a little uh, scared about you maybe taking his job with that completion percentage. Uh, so, Pat, talk, talk about both your passes in 84 were to uh, Stanford Jennings. Were those, were those plays that you called your audible, or was that a, a play caught off the bench? No, we put them in. You know, one quick story about punting. I remember – so I had Stanford Jennings. I had Marv Cobb, who was a safety before. So I always had really small guys in front of me. I remember when Chicago, my first year was Dick Butkus' last, I think, and he was the up back for the Chicago Bears, and they never rushed. The defense never came. It was the luckiest thing ever for that punter. Um, but, yeah, I was quarterback in high school my whole life since I was 10. And then when I went to Harvard and I went out and there were – we had like 50 guys on the team, but 16 of them were quarterbacks. Which you can imagine, those are the kids that get into Harvard. So I decided to be a receiver. <laughs> it was a good. <laughs> well, good. So, so, so tell me. So, so Pat, I just if there's a question we ask and you don't want to answer, we're not going to put you in a bad spot. But I did get some questions to throw your way from some of your former teammates here. So, um, so <laughs> if, you can say no comment if you want here. But it, I don't think these are too bad. So, so Kenny said, <laughs> Kenny said. That every contract year, you were telling Kenny, "Hey, I I need 15 catches so you can negotiate as a wide receiver." Is that true? Is Kenny messing with Absolutely, hundred percent. Every third year, and he did it. He did it. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Well, they shouldn't have been paying me for two positions. I had to practice. <laughs> Hell yeah! Hell yeah! So, <laughs> so Kenny helped you negotiate your contract. I love it, man. For sure. <laughs> That's good stuff. That's good stuff. All right, so I wanted to talk you. It's funny, you know, I, I, Pat, a lot of the younger Bengal fans, they, they know your name, but they really didn't know uh, that you were not just a, a great punter, but you're a hell of a receiver. You know, punters and kickers are athletes too, right? Uh, punters have to be great athletes. I've never seen one that didn't have great hands because you got to right. catch snaps. And uh, like Ray Guy was a uh, all conference DB, you know, in college. And, uh, so the first thing I do with my high school punters is I only pick, I don't care how he kicks. I just want to know if he can catch the ball. So that's the Got first it. thing we teach him how to punt. 
So what's crazy is one of the things I found, Pat, is uh, I know you were drafted in, in 75. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So you didn't play your rookie year, and I'm blaming the Pittsburgh Steelers for this damn thing. And, and uh, we posted something on social media earlier this week, uh, this play. So we're going to play a clip, Pat, from the uh, 1975 College All-Star Game. So let me kind of share with people because I know there's a lot of folks out there that didn't know this. From 1934 to 1976 – uh, the NFL Super Bowl champions played uh, the the college all stars, the seniors from the year before in a game. They played in Chicago every year from '34 to 1976. So this clip right here is a clip of of Pat McAnally from that '75 game, catching the being introduced and catching the first touchdown. Number 84 from Harvard, drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals, Pat McAnally. McAnally, 84 from Harvard, 6'6", six, six, is in at the wide receiver position left side as Markowski has time, 100, he's got McAnally wide open! Side of the play. Beautiful pass protection. In back in the alley. It's just simply a crossing pattern. You can see the defensive secondary. Thomas coming across. Wagner coming across. Getting against the grain motion. And when Barkowski hit him full speed, he was able to take it into the end zone. And McAnally is carried by. So, Pat, don't, don't mean to bring up that sore memory there, but talk about that. Do you remember that at all? First of all, it was a, it was a great thing for me because uh, it gave me a year off. I remember when uh, the Walter Payton was on that team, the All Star team, and uh, he came and visited me in the hospital. And he said, "You know, I'm laying there with my leg broken," and he's saying, "You're lucky. You know, just take the next year and eat. You know, you're so." He called me Mr. Green Jeans because I was like six six, 185 pounds or something. It made Collinsworth look like Adonis, but anyway. Uh, so I was, every Ivy leaguer wants to have a year off. So I was fortunate to be able to take the year off and gain a little bit of weight. But the important thing was that Chip Myers retired the, before the next season and the Bengals, we traded Charlie Joyner to a hall of fame career with the chargers. I don't know if I would have made the team that year. Honestly, it was, we were really stacked at receivers with Isaac and John uh, McDaniels. Uh, so it would have been tough and Dave Green punning. So anyway, yeah. it worked great for me. Well, I mean, as if we don't, hey, Pat, I don't know about you. You don't have to make a comment on us. But as us being fans and everybody that's watching right now, live stream on Facebook and YouTube, uh, as if we didn't need another damn reason to hate the Steelers. It, you know, <laughs> they break your damn leg. But it wasn't, it didn't look like it was a malicious hit. I mean, you just kind of diving into yeah. the end zone there. But Yeah, I always thought they were embarrassed that a skinny guy from Harvard scored a touchdown. <laughs> That was the, you know, steel curtain. They were world champions. Can you imagine all these first round draft choices and stuff playing a game against the world champ Super Bowl champions and spending three weeks before going to camp in Chicago? It was amazing. And I think they canceled it the next year because they had a bid storm or something. But yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It was fun though. It was really fun. So that so that crossing pattern, that crossing pattern, that crossing pattern, yeah, they still have problems covering that crossing pattern even today. So. Yeah, they do. Along those lines, Pat, that's been 45 years since that game's been played. Um, tell us about, you said you practiced for three weeks leading up to it. Tell us about that, how players were selected for that uh, team, who coached it, and what went in kind of behind the scenes. Yeah, so that was my fourth All-Star game because I played in uh, Hula Bowl, the Senior Bowl, and the East-West Shrine game. But this was a great opportunity because, you know, for me, I'd been in the Ivy League playing against, you know, cornerbacks who were like five foot eight. And there were six first round draft choices in my class. So I, I gave me a great opportunity to improve. But what was really funny was our coach was John McKay from SC. It was old SC coaching staff. And he had a, a, a huge ego. I was raised in Orange County. So I was following his interviews my, my whole life. And so one day I ran into him in the elevator and he uh, he stopped me and he said, you know, how come, you know, you wouldn't go to USC. We were trying to recruit you. And uh, I looked at him 
And I said, you know, Coach McKay, the thing is, both of my parents wanted me, and in fact, they insisted that I go to fully accredited college. Oh, huge. <laughs> but, you know, to give him credit, he had the guts to start me, you know, to – it was pretty radical to have an Ivy Leaguer. I remember I was in the Senior Bowl, too. I was the only one in, like, 50 years or something. So, uh, but John McKay, he, he started me, and they got me the ball, as you could see, as you could see very early in the game. And, you know, what's frustrating is we went up 14 nothing in that game against the world champions. We had a really good team. And, in fact, Walter Payton didn't even play because he was hurt in practice. But you know who beat us? Jefferson Joe Gillum. Gilliam. Remember that backup quarterback? He came in and scored 21 points for him. Uh, Not- yeah, because Bradshaw didn't do it. It was 21-14 was the final, right? Yes. We were uh, 14 no. Yeah, I'll tell everybody. It, it, go on YouTube and just uh, you know search the 1975 college All-Star game. It, it's a really cool thing to see all these college seniors from the year before playing the Super Bowl champs. It's uh, it's something unique that would never happen today's uh, NFL. But uh, I tell you, it's cool. funny, too. We had a guard named Bill Bain. From USC and he was legendary crazy so he he hated the fact that LC Greenwood was wearing you know his gold shoes so we had a pitch and we were running the ball left he was the left guard he pulled right and almost knocked him out of the game he put LC Greenwood on his back because naturally none of his reads he went opposite our poor running back got thrown for a five-yard loss he knocked Greenwood in the next week I'm telling you it was funny <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm gonna have to go back and pull that clip. I'd like to see that one. So, so Pat, what, what's okay? So every Bengal fan um, that is any type of collector has has these dudes right here. All right, you kind of probably were expecting this one right here. So oh, got a bunch of. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Who do you got there? Is, is that Rodney Holman? You got there, Rodney John? Holman. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I got Boomer and Jeff Blake and. I got Munoz and Takia Spikes. I just don't oh have Pat McAnally yet. I just I got to get Pat. So Pat, I'll tell everybody, you yeah, absolutely. Tell tell the, our viewers right now, Pat. You conceived that that lineup suit, those action figures in '86, I think, and pitched the idea to Kenner Toys here in the Cincinnati area. Tell us how that all came about and, and how that took off for you. Well, I had a condo up in Mount Adams. Uh, my wife, Leslie, and I had, and I sold it to a guy named Bruce Stein, who uh, Kenner got from Mattel out here and made him a senior vice president. He was a really sharp marketer. So we were just sitting sitting around in the condo after it sold, and I was thinking, how can I sell him some of this furniture so I don't have to bring it out to California? And we got to talking, and he knew, uh, he found out that I wrote a column for kids, uh, parents of kids, and he said, hey, you already know uh, families, so come up with a toy idea for me. And I remember I came up, so I, I called him like a week later, a couple days later, and I said, uh, how about Dino World? I remember it distinctly. So I came up with this concept of dinosaurs, which he rejected. He said, I, I can." Yeah, I remember him saying, like, uh, no wonder you, you you had a lot of concussions, didn't you? You know, that that's not a very good idea. Anyway, but years later, they actually did it, but not because of me. Well, anyway, so he said, come up with an idea, another better idea. And um, he said, but first, let me take you to a toy store. So he took me to a toy store in uh, northern Kentucky. And we were looking around and we came into the the, um, aisle with G.I. Joe's. And I picked up the G.I. Joe and I I was looking at it and it was like Bazooka Bill. He primarily carries a bazooka, but he also, you know, totes the uh, ammunition. So and I looked at it and I said, oh, my gosh. Why don't they don't have, why why do they have to make up you know Bazooka Bill? They already know who Walter Payton is, you know, and and that was my concept. So I didn't say anything to him. I went home, to California. About a couple of weeks later, the uh, Kentucky or the Kenner people deigned to give me fifteen minutes to present my idea. And uh, on the way to Kenner downtown, I stopped in a little store and I bought a pack of cards, baseball cards for like, you know, 60 cents. And then the uh, Bruce gave me an articulated figure, one of their Star Wars figures. And then uh, so I had a 15 minutes. They had their top like 30 people there. And I left two hours later and I went into uh, my hotel room. And about 20 minutes later, they were downstairs with a check to hold the idea for a week. And with Bruce, 
uh, to New York on Monday. Uh, a few days later, we got football day one on Monday. Tuesday, we got foot baseball. Wednesday, we got basketball. And we weren't looking at hockey at the time. So we went three for three. And then it took another six months to get the unions, naturally. But uh, anyway, that's how it happened. Isn't that weird? That's, cool. that's great. I mean, that's amazing. So the pretty big hit. No, I mean, that is, I remember, in, I think 88 or 89, correct me if I'm wrong, Pat, was the first year. So what year did you guys actually start the discussions? It was actually 87 because they wouldn't, they wouldn't allow me to have my name on it, you know, as a, a creator. But if you look on the back of the packages, there's an 87 inside of a football, which yep. was, you know, my football number, but also my logo and yeah. my company. And they're on the back. Yeah, there it is. The yeah. 87. Yeah. Nobody, you know, but they were so smart. You know, when they got asked about it uh, in the media and stuff, they said, oh, that's the in, the year of inception. They never gave me credit. Wow. <laughs> so how did that, the name, yeah, they said, and it did start in 87. So how did the name starting lineup come about? They, they definitely created that. They did. Gotcha. Any good ideas, man. I mean, I did make up bad answers for kids. The register did or the inquirer did. And they made up starting lineup, which is a great name. That's awesome. Hey, hey Pat, you know, I've, I've heard you tell that story a little bit before. I, I didn't know that 87 on the back. That's a, that's something new to me. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So yeah. that, um, let's keep going with some questions. So Pete Johnson wanted me to ask you a question on air live. He's, he's watching right now, by the way, Pat. He said, ask Pat about uh, the money you guys used when you guys were dunking basketballs. You and Pete were dunking. Oh well. So, so Pete was. Want to... What do you think? What was he? Five nine or five ten? Two six. He's not six foot. Yeah, he's not six foot. I yeah. know that. So we're walking from practice field to go to our lunch, and we walk through the gym there in Wilmington, and the a ball was lying on the ground, and he had like sandals on basically, and I said, Pete, I'll give you fifty bucks if you can. Dunk. He hadn't warmed up. He hadn't done anything. And he took the ball and threw it down. I mean, at 265 pounds. And I always felt sorry for the the boards, you know, the, the floor. because they, they went sunk down a long way. But that was the best $50 I ever lost. It was awesome. To see. <laughs> That's great. I can't believe Pete didn't want to share that story. I was like, Pete, I'm asking you. I'm asking you. Well, you know, Pete is not claiming he was like a 4'4 in high school on the 40s. I mean, his stories get bigger every year. I love Pete. <laughs> All-time favorites. I remember my wife and I, when we were addressing uh, our wedding invitations, it was so funny because we put Peter Johnson. But it was such a weird – he's so not a Peter, you know, formal. But uh, he's, a, he's a great friend and great guy. Yeah, he's a good man. Good man. All right, so we got, a, uh, we got another video clip, if you don't mind, uh, Pat, we want to share. This isn't you getting hurt in any way, shape, or form, so it's a good video here. So let's play clip three, Jamie, if you don't mind. Oops. Yep. One second. Sorry. Ken Anderson cashed in on a pass to Bengal punter Pat McAnally. McAnally is a Harvard grad with a body like Ichabod Crane and a backward spike he calls the Ivy League revenge. Cincinnati turned game 5,000 into a 27 to 7 runaway over Kansas. The Ivy League revenge? I, that, that was the Isaac Curtis behind the, the head spike. Not quite as cool as Isaac did it, but you know, so I'm always getting tackled when I'm barely in the end zone. <laughs> so, those are not like good clips for, for pushing so, my uh, Hall of Fame bid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My so he, what's funny about that's crazy about that. I think that was your first NFL touchdown, Pat, if I'm not mistaken, against Kansas City. Yes. Uh, in the reg regular season. And with that game, I didn't know if you knew this, that game was the 5,000th game in NFL history played in Kansas City. So you caught your first touchdown in game number 5,000 for the NFL. That's a really cool, cool thing. So, you know, one of my childhood, my biggest heroes was Gerald Wilson, the punter. Um, you know, from uh, Kansas City, and it was very windy there. And he he took me aside before the game and explained, you know, what to, how to handle it, and you know what were the best areas to kick to and stuff. He was great to me. 
And uh, it was really a thrill for me. And then I ended up out punting him by 10 yards that game. So I was really stoked. That's there. awesome. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. All right. So go back to another question. And Pat, are you good on time? I'm real good. Okay, good, good. Let's keep it going. Out so. California, man. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, so, so one of your other former teammates told me to ask you this question, and, and I will not tell you what player, what former teammate told me to ask you this question, but wanted to ask about, it sounded like there was a, a little shenanigans going on at training camp one day, uh, and they gave you guys the day off. And um, you showed up at a meeting, I guess, where Forrest Gregg was getting ready to light everybody up, and he was a little, little pissed about things. And you walked into the meeting, maybe this might be, not be true, Pat, but just you had a hat on, an orange belt, and some shoes, but nothing else. Please, please orange, tell me that's not true. I had the orange uh, wristbands. I had big wristbands <laughs> on. <laughs> so, it was really fortunate because uh, we'd had the night off, the day off before, and had a party that they absolutely were destructive in by the end. He was going to, and everybody was always appreciative because he was going to, you know, really light into us, like you said. But he started laughing so hard when I walked in. And uh, I like to not take it personally that he was laughing at me about <laughs> the state of uh, being at the time. But, uh, and, and he ended up, he just couldn't start laughing, stop laughing for like 10 or 15 minutes. And, uh, and so he didn't yell at the team and uh, the team was happy and, uh, and I, we went to the Super Bowl that year, and I made it sound like it was Chris Collinsworth that did that. <laughs> really mad. And he and he did an interview later, and you know, disclaimed it and made sure and told everyone it was me. But anyway, so that is a true story. I'll never forget the only face I remember seeing when I was walking in there was Mike Brown was not pleased, <laughs> but at least he wasn't squinting. Uh. <laughs> so, so I heard what I was told. It might be, you know, embellished a little bit is that uh, everybody was there sitting down. You were the last one to walk into the room, right? Yes. Perfect timing. Of course, <laughs> so, never find me. So he was saying, oh, I'm going to get McAnally now. He's late. I got it. And, uh, and then he, when I walked in and he stopped laughing, finally, he said, well, I'm not going to find you for being late, but, you know, you're not. I'm going to find you for wearing a hat indoors, which you <laughs> So, of course, it was pretty funny. <laughs> you, you just you just have a vision in my head. Mike, serious Mike Brown sitting there. And Pat walks in the door. I was lucky Katie wasn't in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going back and forth whether I should ask that question, Pat. But it I'm, sounded like you, you saved proud, your point. Man, proud. <laughs> You're the man. <laughs> you saved... Uh, I think Pete said Pete Pete quote in a text said he saved our ass that day. <laughs> it's what what Pete said. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, last one last video. Um, this is you getting hit, Pat, and it, you, you you recover well from it. But I, this is a, a hit from 1980. I want you to see. But Forrest Gregg believed in the character of his team. A man with less. But Pat McAnally refused to stay down. The Browns lead it 24 to 17, and the Bengals have got their work cut out for them. Stops back to throw. Cox's arm goes far downfield. There's McAnally. Pitches it down at the 10-yard line. Flag and goes down at the two. A great catch by Pat McAnally. That's the touchdown. He made it in. McAnally was knocked out of the ball game and had his neck x-rayed in the first half has come back and just made a magnificent catch along that far sideline. That's got to be some great revenge for Pat McAnally and absolutely. So, so Pat, in, in that hit, and again, as if we didn't know the reason to hate the city up north, um, you take a hit, you they take you off on a cart. You get x-rayed, head, neck, whatever, and you came back and made that damn play. Do, do, I'm assuming you remember that play, hopefully. Well, I don't remember the hit, but uh, imagine, I, I often think about this, you know, imagine being knocked out. I was out for 20 minutes, get x-rayed, and then I come to, the uh, only reason I came back out before the half was I figured I'm going to milk for some applause, right? So I'm just walking out there without my pads or anything. 
And then after a, about two minutes, Forrest comes up to me and he hated Cleveland. You know that he came oh, up. Yeah. To, can you can you go in and punt? Can you imagine? So you know, I remember Danny Ross and uh, a bunch of guys saying, "Don't do it." You know, Isaac Curtis, you know, saying, "Don't go, don't, don't go in." But I went in, and wouldn't you know? I swear, you can go back and look at the film. I get roughed on my punt. I mean, they on my head again, and um, so then we go into halftime, and uh, also I got to tell you later, but my contract was up, so it was the end of the three years. So I'm thinking maybe I can milk this, you know, somehow. <laughs> um, anyway, so at, at the end of halftime, Forrest comes up to me and says, can you play receiver? <laughs> Wasn't enough to just punt. So I said, uh, yeah, you know, again, thinking contract time, I'll do it. So I remember they called the same exact play where they clear and I come underneath. And I'm not kidding you. You can look at the film. I, they knocked me right on my head again. I mean, I can't believe it. So we go a couple more plays and a couple series, and then Kenny calls it again and with a different name. They tried to trick me. They called, the, they changed the name of the play, but I said no, and I refused to run it. And this is one of the really great, great things that happened to me in, in the NFL. So we were running a sweep to the right. Uh, I think it was Archie Griffin. So I was on the left, far out of the play. And I jogged down the field, and it was Tom Darden, right, that had hit me with the dirty shot. Well, I ran into both his forearms with my face. That was, I guess, my fault. But anyway, so the sweep is going to the right, and Darden is running in front of me. It's the only time I ever tried to hurt somebody. They, uh, I, I just clipped. I mean, I clicked the heck out of him. I hit him in both legs. He went down and started screaming at the refs. And as I'm walking back to the huddle, the ref says, that's your one shot. And that's all. <laughs> Scott tried uh, to kill me so I could try to hurt him, I guess. <laughs> damn Steelers, damn Browns. Um, yeah, that, that yep, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's crazy. That was a hell of a catch over the shoulders. And, and again, it was crazy. It was, that was Jack Thompson throwing that, that touchdown pass to you as well. Yeah. So good stuff. Um, so uh, we have a, a ton of uh, questions popping up here in our, our chat areas right now. And I'm being real greedy taking all the questions, Pat. I am going to ask one more. Um, so it, it can't be an interview without with, with Pat Mac McAnally without talking about the Wonderlick, uh, the only, at least I think still in place, the only perfect score of NFL players on the Wonderlick test was Mr. Pat McAnally. Pat, I took, I got a 13. Is that good? <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> wow. I have no idea. I did not take it, Pat. I did not. You know what? The average score is 20 in the country. So I'm not so bad. <laughs> I've never taken it. Totally joking. <laughs> I got a really funny story about that. I was on the uh, NFL uh, network with Rich Eisen, and there were a couple other guys there with me. And uh, it was Suggs. Suggs was there. Terrell Suggs. I don't know. You know, the linebacker from uh, uh, Baltimore. It was so great. Lewis. Lewis. Well, it doesn't matter. He, he, so he, anyway, so Rich says, well, you know, the, he, and this guy, had, he got 31 on the test. And I said, wow, that, and this is live television, right? And I said, wow, 31 is great. In fact, um, that's the highest scoring group are lawyers, and their average score is 31. And he said, oh, wow, I, then I should go to law school and I can help my uncles in prison. <laughs> <laughs> live TV. And Rich Eisen didn't know what to say. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yes. That's, that's crazy. About that wonder, like, test for those that aren't familiar with it the seniors that get drafted take this test in your opinion is there anything that teams can decipher from those scores that carry on to the nfl or their smarts or any of that stuff absolutely because i did some work with the third generation of the uh, wonderlick family so they've been given it since the 40s um there are certain positions they don't want you to score too high. Uh, there are certain positions they want. You know, offensive line score very well. And they've got, believe me, they've got all the statistical analysis and they know what they're doing. It doesn't mean you're going to be, there are plenty of guys that are great players that got under 20. Um, but generally speaking, people that score like below 10 that, that have had problems. Because you got to learn so much. That's what people don't realize how complicated the pro football game is. 
believe me, when I came from Harvard and uh, I had a lot to learn, you remember we had Bill Walsh then as our offensive coordinator. So uh, I had a lot to learn. So, yeah, I do think it's important. I don't think it's the end all. I mean, I'd rather see a guy that was a linebacker to see his bench press in his 40, but it's a piece. It's an important piece. And the last thing I'll say about it is I was in the rainbow room with the NFL. I was on their board for a while. And George Young, who is legendary GM with the Giants. So I, I, I met him and he said, oh, yeah, you're that guy that got the 50. And he said, look, man, that cost you a couple of rounds. So I wasn't supposed to go in the fifth round. I was supposed to be a second rounder or something. Because we don't like when extremes, we don't like when guys do poorly on that test. And we sure as hell don't like when they do too well. So we, we did not like your 50. That worked against you. That was pretty funny, huh? He told me that. That's interesting. Very interesting. So let's take a few few questions from our chat area here, if you don't mind, Jamie. Uh, thanks again, Pat, for your time. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, so uh, John Paul asked, what's your favorite playing surface, grass, astroturf, or if you've been on a newer field, if at all? Well, first of all, the astroturf's come so far. We Remember, we played uh, every year in the Astrodome, and that was literally carpet on top of concrete, which I have always believed really caught – cost Earl Campbell at least four or five years in his career. Um, so I, as long as you can practice on grass, which we always did at Spinney, I don't know how, you know, how well our lungs did with the pollution. <laughs> at least we had grass. Um, so I only like turf for games because I always fantasize that it made me faster, you know. <laughs> Uh, Chris asks, who was the player you were closest to on the Bengals? Any funny stories you can share? Well, I was very close to well, a lot of them, you know, Kenny and Isaac. And, um, yeah, my, the, my nickname was TW. Uh, I was the only white wide receiver. Uh, that was for token white. And that's what Isaac <laughs> called me. I got to tell you. One of the hardest things, you know, we, we don't practice the, the day after a game. You know, you come in and just do some warming up things. You lift a little bit and you jog around. But one Monday, we actually played tag with the wide receivers and the running backs, but only in the end zone. Man, I never got anybody, right? <laughs> I couldn't catch any of them. <laughs> and they finally felt so sorry for me. They stopped and let me touch one of them. And then, and I immediately ran to the uh, goalposts and clambered up the goalposts you know, way up on the upright so they couldn't touch me. <laughs> I avoided it. <laughs> so. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was very close to Danny Ross, who sadly passed away. And Danny went to Northeastern, and uh, you know, which is in, in Boston. It's the largest private school in the country, and so uh, they had me room with them because I spoke. English and I spoke Boston, right? His accent was so thick. And one night uh, we were uh, a night before game. He was trying to make reservations with Delta Airlines for his in-laws coming from Boston, and they their last name was Hart, right? And he'd say, uh, and they say, well, you know, I could tell that they were asking him, what's their names, and they said hot. He kept saying hot, and they would spell H O U H T. I finally had to pick up, take the phone from him and say it is heart. <laughs> That's a true story, Danny Ross. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sam, Sam says he's reading up on Wikipedia about you. Can you tell us some more about your foundation, Play College Now Foundation? Sounds interesting. Yes. Um, so we've been uh, fortunate. Uh, what I noticed was everybody's clamoring for all the D1 surefire prospects. So – I just, and I was coaching the small call, uh, Christian high school, which I am now again. So I, but I knew that every one of those uh, small schools had kids that were undersized. Like we had a five foot four slot and a five, eight running back and a five, nine cornerback. And those three kids are now, they all went to, uh, they all started as sophomores in college and they, uh, they went to like Claremont McKenna and, and uh, Pitts are these really, really good schools. So that's what I'm most interested in. It's if football can help you get into a better school academically, like let's say you could get in with a, a 3.4 versus a 3.9 or something, then that's what excites me. So football is just a vehicle. And we've had a, 
a lot of success getting kids in all over the country. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome, right. Mike. Uh, got one more here, I believe. Uh, sorry. I think I've asked all the. I think I've asked all the questions for him. Well, uh, well, Jamie's looking for that other one, Pat. Can you talk about the experience at Harvard? Of uh, you know that I think we look at Harvard and man, what a what a great institution for for learning. How did that translate with with football and and getting earning that Harvard degree? Yeah, I broke my my dad's heart heart when I went to Harvard over uh, Notre Dame. It was ironic because my senior year, I made a, there were two uh, All America wide receivers. One was Pete Dimmerly from Notre Dame, and me from Harvard. And he turned down Harvard to go to Notre Dame. Uh, if we had gone to the same schools, we would have offset each other. And never made All America, so it was kind of ironic. But uh, I just uh, fell in love with the school. I visited it just to hide from recruiters. So I could, we paid our own money to go visit. And uh, I wanted to uh, figure out where I wanted to go to school. I didn't want to be bugged. So I never thought I'd go there. Uh, I actually stayed with James Brown, you know, NFL today. You know, he was uh, the number one basketball recruit in the entire country. I mean, Wooden was after him and everything at UCLA. So um, that's that was my experience. You know, I, I didn't want to be owned on a scholarship. Um, they had a great passing offense and a very progressive uh, offensive coordinator, head coach. So I, I was and you know, they never were short on quarterbacks. Like I, I said, those are the kids that go there. Right. So it was great. I actually went and stayed with all basketball players and met the football coach for like a half hour decided a week before the season to go out just so I can meet new friends. And, um, you know, it's just really weird. They just kept throwing me the ball. So I was really lucky. I had a great freshman year and, um, and I wanted to make, my biggest goal was to make all American in football. Cause it would mean nothing at Notre Dame or SC or one of those schools. And you know what the, the last all American was like 40 some years before, you know what his name was? Indicott, Chubb Peabody the third. Is that great? <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah. And he went on to be governor of Massachusetts. Wow. In Chubb Peabody the third. I love it. That's great. Cool. <laughs> so Pat, we'll, we'll have a one one more question. We'll let you go here. It means a lot uh having you on. It's we've had a very large chunk of your Super Bowl teammates from 1981 on the shows over the past few months. It's been fun. But just everybody has had some sort of story uh that they've been able to share about Paul Brown. Do you have anything unique that you could, uh, a story, uh, something that you're able to share with us, uh, a memory of PB? Well, I remember I was told this, by I can't remember if it was Trumpy or somebody else, but Dave Green, you know, was the punter the year before I got there. And he, on his own, ran a fake punt. You know, ran, tried to go around the right end, got tackled and injured. And Paul Brown came out and he was screaming at him, you deserve to get hurt. You <laughs> <laughs> so, so Trump, Trump, he was telling me, don't go do your own thing. <laughs> the last punter. So that's the one that's thing I, I really remembered. <laughs> that's good stuff. So la last story I want to share, and I'm going to try to tell this story. So, Pat, this is a, a, a picture of you, and it's a, a, a sketch uh, that a gas station here would do. When I was maybe 11, 10, 11, 12 years old, my dad would go fill up his car, and every week he'd bring me home a different Bengal player. So I, I didn't like this one because I wanted Pat McAnally as the receiver, not Pat McAnally as the, the punter. So I kept telling my dad, I was like, I want another one. Well, this is when I was real little, Pat, don't laugh. I want another one, but I want Pat catching the ball. I don't want to see him kicking the damn thing. I want to see. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, you but, know, Rosworth and those guys used to always make fun of me. But th and then I went to the College Football Hall of Fame and I was in a number of spots. Uh, within the Hall of Fame, and uh, but now that I actually made the Collegiate Hall of Fame, which by the way I got a the funny thing about that was so the last guy that made it that actually played was this into Chubb into you know Peabody made it uh, like in the seventies or eighties or something. But the latest guy was like eight years ago. He played. Are you ready for this? He made it in the Hall of Fame. He played in eighteen ninety eight. <laughs> Well, wow, jeez. <laughs> so for me to make it is a pretty, pretty big deal. <laughs> it was pretty cool. That's great. 
Well, Pat, you don't know how much it means. We have had so many of the what we call the OG Bengals on from the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, we've had several players from the 90s, and we'll have some current players on. But it it is so cool to hear the stories that you're sharing. Uh, some of these stories I, I think I've heard before, but you would not believe how many viewers right now, Pat, that that you know uh, weren't Bengal fans, weren't even alive when you know when I was watching the Bengals younger. But they're hearing stories and hearing the history. Uh, of the teams that you played on and stories from you. So we, we appreciate you sharing these stories, Pat. It, it's, re- it's, it's really cool for me to hear these things. And I love that the, the younger Bengal fans get to hear these stories as well. Well, my wife is the number one. She was raised on the West side. She is the number one fan. And we have some weird fans. You know, uh, my son was interviewing with uh, Urban Meyer. Uh, just this last year, we were at, in Ohio State. You know, Pete claimed he set up the whole meeting. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Urban immediately, I mean, it was unbelievable. He, he, he was raised on the West Side, and he was a huge fan. But he he immediately said, what was Al Bochamp like? He was throwing out these names that even I had forgotten about, you know, that were great players and great guys. And and he said, I remember you had that one punt, and it hit the pylon. You know, it actually yeah. hit the pylon but they made it a touchback, but it should have been out at the one. But anyway, so it's always fun. Uh, we even have a couple out here in California, but not too much. <laughs> so your, your wife grew up on the West side of Cincinnati, Pat? She did. She went to Taylor high school and just loves it. She gets dressed for the games and she loves it. So, uh, I, and I, I, this year, you know, that San Francisco game, the third game of the year or whatever, um, yeah. up in the suite. And it was really, really fun. And, uh, I remember thinking how fast they were. Remember how fast they were? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Offensively and defensively. And, boy, they had a heck of a year, didn't they? So Yeah, they did. They did. So, so Pat, tell the wife. I, I am live right now from the west side of Cincinnati as well. So, west High side school. to west side. She, <laughs> what high school? Yep. Well, thanks, Pat. We appreciate your time, buddy. It means a lot. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jamie. What high school? Yes, what high school? Oh, my high school. Don't lay, don't lay it, Pat. I went to Western Hills High School. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. That's what it was good high school. I, I was there. It was pretty good. All right. Well, thanks, so, guys. It was fun. All right. Really Thank you, buddy. Appreciate Thank it. You. Good day. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, buddy. That I uh, love the the starting lineup story. That's you know I can remember going to a, being a kid and running to the store to uh, to get those from what was I don't know Zares and I don't even remember the stores back then that uh, Hills. That uh, yeah. we had in the in the Northeast to uh, to get those, but that's a pretty cool story about that that eighty seven on the back. So I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. You, you got it threw me off. You started pulling out all your toys, and I, I don't have anything ready. I was <laughs> juicy crew. I was going to hold up. <laughs> well, it's funny. I'm going to have to go back and watch this stuff because I was just so the TW the token white guy. That was hilarious. The token. <laughs> All right, well, let's get moving here. Uh, that was awesome. Pat gave us a good 45 minutes almost. That was really cool to to, to get going there. So let's go ahead and bring on our, our fan of the week. If, is he in the room right now, Jamie? Yes, sir. All right. Josh Uday, buddy. Welcome, man. Hey, oh. Thanks for having me on. There we go. Yeah. Th- hey, thanks, buddy. So so Josh is is from West Palm Beach, Florida, lives, lives there now. And Josh uh, is one of the administrators. Him and his buddy Mike uh, run a, a a page on Facebook called Who Day Nation, and that thing has gotten huge. I mean, I think there's over eight thousand followers now on that on that page. There's a lot of interaction with Bengal fans uh, across the country and across the world. Really good stuff there. That's kind of why he's here, but mostly because he's a diehard Bengals fan. And uh, so, Josh, tell us your story, brother. How did you become a fan? What, what you know? Tell us a little bit of a story about that. Um, I basically became a fan in about 2003. Uh, I was about 12 years old, going into seventh grade. Um, it was, you know, I, it was just like kind of the natural thing. I was just starting to play football, so um, I started to follow the Bengals. Um, my dad was a fan, but I just didn't get into sports until around that age. But um, yeah, about 2003, Kitna was quarterback uh, for Palmer's rookie year, and then uh, you know went on from there. Uh, favorite player, AJ Green. Uh, got his jersey on here, right here. Oh yeah, hell yeah! yeah. Uh, been a fan ever since. So. so you you grew up in Cincinnati, and moved to West Palm Beach. Is that what happened, or? Uh, yes, uh, I was born and raised there. I lived there until I was about 
26. Um, so I've only lived down here about three years now. Okay. Okay. So how's this Facebook page going? What, what, tell us a little bit of story about that, how it started and, and how it's taken off and why it's taken off. Oh, great. Uh, so who day nation, uh, I run that page with uh, a handful of admins who are a huge help to me um, and everything that we do with that. But it's just a, you know, just a place for fans to meet or anything history talking about the current season, what's coming up uh, with, you know, the roster changes, anything like that, just discussion. Um, and, you know, you want that to lean towards positivity. Um, you know, sometimes it gets tough for the fan yep, base yep. Um, and people get frustrated, but you know, uh, we try and make it a fun environment. Yep. That's good stuff. We a Facebook group is a thankless job. I mean, Jimmy, I know you got, you know, this as well. You get, I mean, obviously you get some really great people. You meet some people, make some friends, but then you get some people that come in there and just, you just, you don't, you don't know. Like it's just people post crazy things. I'm sure you've had to deal with some pretty crazy stuff too, eh? Uh, yeah, definitely. But uh, I'm thankful because the guys that I have on staff with me, uh, like we have eyes like all over the page that like, I mean, stuff gets handled before I even see it sometimes. And it's just like <laughs> very helpful. It's a thankless job. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's good stuff, Josh. So, do you get back in town at all for any games every now and then? You come in for a, you know a game for a weekend or two? Uh, I have. It's only, it has been two years now, um, but I'm still going to do that. And uh, I know we talked a little bit. I'm going to try and get to the game in Miami this year. You know, um, given the circumstances, but I went to the game in Miami last year. Um, so I'll you know <laughs> that go down. Um, but Sounds yeah, like there are a lot I'm of Bengals fans this year. There. If we can get in the stadium, yeah. in Miami, there, were, there were actually um, a surprising amount of fans down there. Yeah, yeah. James was saying Miami's on the schedule for December, so hopefully yeah. there's fans. If there's, if, 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 if there's fans in the stands. We got to figure that out. Yep. Yep. So. So, Josh, I know you, you had a uh, a picture of your girlfriend that you sent us. Said, so, was she a Bengals fan, or did you did you get her to become a Bengals fan? How did that all work out? Converted and still, you know, still working that in because she's not like uh, huge into the sports and stuff. But she's she's game to like you know follow along and and learn things. <laughs> That's great. So, That's great. Sam. Sam uh, uh, I think it's part of your page as well. He just posted in the comments for anyone that's watching. Uh, a link to the Houday Nation Facebook page or Facebook group. So we encourage our uh, our fans. Sam Gormley watching. is actually one of my admins too. Cool. Oh, yeah. Good. We encourage people. No, I mean, I know I'm on there. Jimmy, I've seen you post on there a few times too. James, I think you're on there too, aren't you? I just lurk. I just lurk. You lurk? You're a lurker? Yeah. Just there to read the comments. <laughs> the popcorn emoji. <laughs> Jeez. Well, Josh, the the the, uh, the Facebook page is awesome, man. So it's very, it's a very you guys do a very good job with it, collecting information and kind of putting it in, in streaming and sourcing it to one area for everybody. And not everybody can has the tools or the ability to be able to do that. So that's a really big thing you're doing for a lot of Bengal fans across the country and across the world. Um, guys, anything else for for Josh as we have him on? I'm curious, Josh, when you think Burrow's going to sign? I, I think it's going to be, you know. I'm not really, I, I haven't even concerned myself with it. I think it's going to be, you know, <laughs> I, you know, they're yeah. just, they're just working out the logistics, but it's going to be, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to not sign him. That's just not going to happen. <laughs> all right, Josh. All right, Josh. The day and time that he signs. Come on. Let's get a bold to section here. Let's, Let's go. go. Come on. Well, this is going live right now. We're going to tape it and, and post it. Come on. If you get it right. Let's go with uh, tomorrow at 2 p.m. at the, yeah. Yeah, 2 p.m. I, I like that. I like that guess. I'll be okay with that. Yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> all right. So, so when you get that right, we're going to repost this on all the social media. It's going to it's going to go viral for you. Yeah. <laughs> Josh, we appreciate it, Ben. And, and what we're hoping is that we get to hang out with you down in Miami, buy you a beer, and uh, thanks again for everything you do, you do, buddy. We appreciate it. Who day? Appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me on, and uh, great job with everything you guys are doing. Everything that you said about my page. Uh, I just want to say the same same exact thing back to you guys. You, you guys do an awesome job with the stuff you put out. The video content and everything is like not matched as far as uh, Bengals content, like on Facebook especially. Cool, man. Thanks. We appreciate, we appreciate it, man. Hey, 
Bengal yeah. fans follow Bengal fans, and we stick together no matter what through the thick and thin. We appreciate you, Josh. Thanks Definitely. again, buddy. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Who day? Who day? All right. A little delay there on the audio, but I think we got most of uh, what we we're trying to get from him about the page. So I obviously encourage everybody that's watching to, you'll see it in the comments as you're watching. Um, Sam, one of the admins there, shared the link. So if you're not part of that group already, you want to join the hive mind. Yeah. Some other, uh, Bengals fans, go and check it out. Good stuff, man. Good sure. stuff. So. Let's go ahead, guys. We are we are skipping the question of the week this week. Obviously, we went about 40, 45 minutes with Pat. Anybody, anytime we get a player that wants to go that, an next player wants to go that long, we're going to let them. <laughs> we want to respect their time, but that was great. So uh, we are going to kind of jump into uh, History 101 right now, and we're going to have a really cool topic with Tom. Justin, we're going to talk about Bengals training camp. And uh, what's up, Tom? Easy How you guys. doing, buddy? Pretty hey, good. Man. Uh, awesome. Awesome. So, so, Tom, as we set this up for for your, for this discussion, we're going to talk about, you know, training camp and maybe some stories around training camp. But uh, the Bengals, when Paul Brown started uh, the team, we found he found Wilmington, Ohio, and they used Wilmington, Ohio from 68, 1968 to 1996. They moved from Wilmington down to Georgetown, Kentucky from 97 through 2011. And from 2012 to to current, uh, the, the training camp now is here in Cincinnati. But let's start back at the beginning of this, Tom. Let's talk about you know, Paul Brown and selecting Wilmington. What what kind of discussion we're going to have around that? There was you know, a lot of discussion about w where the Bengals would train. And there were some rumblings that they, they may train at Dayton. And the odds-on favorite was Miami with all Paul Brown's, you know, that's where he played, all the connections. It was close to Cincinnati. But evidently one day he and Mike were going back and forth uh, from Cleveland to Cincinnati. And on 71 – Paul mentioned that he remembered playing baseball against Wilmington College, like his junior year in college. And so they pulled off on 71, drove into Wilmington, looked around the college, liked it. Uh, they could only be outside because the college was all locked up. But Paul liked the outlook, uh, the out how everything was laid out. Three practice fields were really nice. They were formed up against what looked like to be a newer gymnasium. And they were getting ready to leave, and a lady they'd noticed had been kind of eavesdropping as to what they were talking about and uh, mentioned that she was the nighttime custodian and there was nobody else there and unlocked the gym and took them through a full tour of the athletic offices and the locker rooms and the gymnasium. Had no idea who they were, just heard them talking about how nice the college was. And uh, as they were walking back to their car, Paul told Mike, I think this is it. Let's make this happen. So a couple of days later, uh, there was an agreement. Yeah, I, I guarantee you, Tom, not a whole lot of people uh, are familiar with that. So let's talk about Wilmington. So I have, uh, again, so as we kind of, I have these old 1978, 79 Wilmington uh, training camp publications that they would always that do. And this is a logo on the front of there, Jimmy. Look at isn't that. that thing beautiful, man? I love Gorgeous. that little running tag. Love it. To find that. So let's talk. Let's talk about some stories now. Uh, about uh, a month and a half, two months ago, Pete, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Kenny Anderson was talking about his uh, training camp uh, escapades when he was chasing, they were having a talcum powder fight, and uh, Ron Pritchard, uh, he was chasing him down, dunking the ta talcum powders. He was trying to get away uh, during training camp. Somebody kicked the door open and cracked his head open, and Tommy Casanova, the, the medical uh, who uh, basically was studying to be a doctor, stopped the bleeding. I think he stitched him up. Uh, and, and Kenny made sure Paul Brown in practice and meetings the next day, he was wearing his helmet in the meetings and wearing his helmet during helmet calisthenics. Yeah. <laughs> so hit, Paul Brown from the coaching staff till the swelling went down enough. They could get the helmet off. Yeah. Uh, that was, so one, Paul, I, I think that the most legendary thing about Wilmington though, was the heat. I mean, automatically when the Bengals showed up and anybody that, that went up and, and stood on those lines and watched him practice. I mean, auto, the, the low was like 92 with 96% humidity every day up there. I mean, you, you talk to Pete Johnson all the time. You can ask Pete. It'd be in the, in the newspapers because Pete would always show up maybe a pound or two overweight, but they'd be like, you know, at the end of practice, they'd drag Pete in, put him on the scales and be like, my God, he lost 12 pounds of water during practice today. So we got to get water. But yeah, the heat was terrible. In the early days, it was the high draft picks. You could tell a high draft pick because they always had fans that graduated the window units. And then in the eighties, uh, Boomer was the topper. he would show up 
with two window units. As Stanford Jennings said, he almost got frostbite. He was the only guy that nearly froze to death at Wilmington because Boomer would get two window units in a, in a window and, and crank them down. And uh, yeah, for Stanford, poor Stanford Jennings nearly froze to death. But but the heat, uh, the, the other thing, especially in the early days, if you're talking about Wilmington, is players around the league and players that came in were shocked at how well they were treated, uh, other than the Wilmington humidity. Uh, the Bengals were known for, you know, feeding the players really well, best of food, uh, you know, any anything they needed, Nautilus equipment, weight equipment, you know, they, they took everything up there. Uh, they really functioned well up there, you know, till they moved to Georgetown and had had great times in Georgetown and uh, and now at the stadium. But, yeah, the one thing, you know, Bob Maddox, when we talked about the food, he held the record with his team watching, had no problem. He, he had six T-bone steaks with all the trimmings on the side. And then when it, with his teammates' jaws all open, got up, walked up to the food line, grabbed the whole turkey tucked it under his arm and informed him that he got hungry about midnight and he was taking it back to the dorm room for his midnight <laughs> snack. Uh, good stuff. Some of these stories, man, there's so many great stories. Now I just want to make sure everybody heard that. So imagine on a weekend like this, when it's 95 degrees, a hundred, whatever, hundred percent humidity, and you don't have air conditioners uh, back then. I mean, can you imagine that in the seventies oh, and early eighties? Seventies. Oh yeah. It was, yeah. It was beastly for him, but you know, they had that, they must've had a ton of fun. The back up there, you know, Jess Phillips, the old fullback, was evidently legendary. He was an insomniac. He would wait till bed check until the coaches, he knew the coaches were asleep. Get in his car, drive to Cincinnati about 1, 2 a.m., see what was going on, and be back for breakfast. The players would say that in the mornings you'd walk to the cafeteria. Every car had dew covered all over him, but they said if you put your hand on Jess Phillips' uh hood you'd get a third degree burn from uh because his engine would be so hot he would get back just before it was it was time to get up so it was a fun yeah. time it, it really built uh camaraderie and um it was it's an important part of, of bengal history the, the one thing with that though when you mention cars and i don't know if J jamie's still there before he put up the marissa contapelli backdrop <laughs> he had a, a solomon brandon jersey Hanging up there. And do you know who that is, Jimmy? Uh, it's, I know the name, but explain uh, to everybody. Solomon Brandon will always go down in Bengal history. He scored the first touchdown in Bengal history. It was in a preseason game, but in a game situation, he scored the first touchdown. He played a couple of years in Kansas City, was on their Super Bowl team against the Packers, went to the Jets, played for the Jets, and then was taken in the allocation draft. So he goes through camp, gets to the first preseason game, Steps in front of the Lynn Dawson pass and, and runs it back. Pick six. First time he will forever be in Bengal lore. So this is on a Saturday night. The guys have Sunday off. Sunday night he pulls in with a brand new sports car into the parking lot at Wilmington. Brand new suit. He's looking good. The rookies are just, you know, whistling and oogling. But the, the veterans, especially the guys that have been around a while, just kind of looked at each other. And that new sports car was leaving Wilmington the next day. Wasn't anything personal. He had nothing to do with the car or the suit, but just wasn't a part of Paul Brown's plans for the future. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, he was, he was counting on getting that big salary that year that, that never happened. Yep. Oh, geez. So let's talk about moving from, um, from Wilmington to, to Georgetown. And obviously I got to have to have one of the, a Georgetown publication here from a camp in 1998. We were talking earlier about the, we were thinking it was Willie Anderson in Wilmington. I think the first year they moved to, uh, to uh, Georgetown was Willie Anderson's first year, probably. So uh, Georgetown was a little bit of an upgrade for the for the team, though. It, it really was. Um, it, the facilities are newer. And, of course, Georgetown's college team really wants for nothing. It's still accessible from Cincinnati. Uh, you know, everything down there was new, nice. It was very common to see the players, especially after all the night practices, you'd see them out a lot of times with their families, you know, taking their kids to get an ice cream. Um, the heat followed them down there, but everything, everywhere was air conditioned. I remember when they moved, you know, you probably remember, I read that a thousand times. Everything is air conditioned here. But, uh, you know, the, the, the dorms were, were much newer, much more modern. And, it, you know, it served the team well. Uh, Willie Anderson was his first year. Uh, he went there, but, you know, uh, after they drafted Carson and 
Uh, Chad came in there. So there were a lot, and, and the Bengals went to a lot of night practices, which were very popular down there. It was an yeah. easy drive and uh, it was a great, it's a great place to watch a game in a really nice city. Just the practicalities of the NFL was kind of dictated. They move everything to PBS. Right. And, and it's funny for me, I just remember um, years ago, the last few years at training camp up in Wilmington, it was almost an exactly an hour trip from my house to Wilmington. Mm-hmm. And when they went to Georgetown, it was almost exactly an hour trip from here to Georgetown, just an hour south versus an it, hour it's, north. It's really easy. And then there's so many Bengal fans down in the Lexington area. You know, it gave them a little bit more of a connection to the team yeah. as well. Yep. Yep. So good stuff. Tom, anything else on, on training camp you want to hit on? What time do you think? Joe Burrow's going to sign. Uh, I missed that time. I, I My bet was 9.09 Friday morning, so I think it's going to be tomorrow uh, at some point. I've already I've already messed, messed my, my pull up, man, my, my Joe Burrow. So what's your what's your guess, Tom? We'll put I'm you on record here. I'm going to tomorrow at 3.45 uh, because, you know, uh, the Bengals front office is a lot smarter than other NFL front offices in this town. We don't need that much time to operate the fax machine properly to get everything to the league office to get it approved by the end of the day. So That's right. you know, he's, he's going to be here. Uh, you're going to keep him healthy. I hope everybody out there remembers to keep Joe Burrow healthy by wearing a mask. And uh, we'll go from there. It's going to be a great era. So what I'm hoping, I know the Cubs are coming in town, I think, uh, to play the Reds. I would absolutely love to see Joe Burrow sign and Joe Burrow throwing out the first pitch at a Reds game. That would be absolutely awesome. Tom, we appreciate it, buddy. Hude, thanks again, man. We'll see you next hey, week. Thanks, we'll see you, buddy. Good to see you, Tom. Today. Thank you. All right. Did you, so, Jamie, I know you probably didn't make it down to Georgetown or Wilmington, I'm assuming, correct? James, did yeah. you by any chance? Yeah, I didn't like you talked about. I just remember the heat, but that's that time of year. I, I don't, regardless of where you are, you know, it's, yeah. you know, in August, it's, you know, the dog days of uh, summer. That's one thing I remember. It's one of Carson's early years, and it might have even been the, also went down when they did the um, the HBO um, series Hard Knocks, which was uh, yeah, which was, was which was pretty cool. But um, you know, it's convenient. You know, I can see you know why they do them in, in Cincinnati now, and everybody basically does them in their backyard. But um, you know, that was cool. And as always, you've got uh, some cool stuff to pull up those old uh, programs from the uh, from the training camp days. Those are pretty cool. I don't even I don't even know why I kept those damn things. The Georgetown one, I just found it in a box of stuff so i'm glad i kept all this stuff it's pretty cool pretty cool well guys let's go ahead and close out here uh, we've got uh we're a little over again but again i pat pat McAnally was absolutely awesome mm-hmm. um for him to give us that much time and there were stories that he shared with us i had never heard ever so really cool stuff so let's go ahead and start with you uh jamie and we'll go from there all right um while you guys were chatting i went and found <laughs> i have a bernard a geo Nice. Yeah. So that's, that's all we can get up here in Canada, man. That's that was it. So that's uh, that's a McFarland, right? That's not a starting lineup. Uh, no, not a starting lineup. This is uh, TMP International. Nice. So wait, they only make made yeah, in. They only make so many of those. Yeah. You know, it's a funny story about this. So um, I bought this and I put it in a fish tank, and then the paint started peeling off and it killed my fish. <laughs> <laughs> I, had take, I had to take it out. So I didn't, uh-huh. say it was, I didn't say it was a happy story. It's a sad, kind of a sad story. <laughs> but it was it wasn't like it was like Walmart fish. It wasn't like expensive fish. But anyway. That's good so, stuff. Good stuff. Uh no, busy week this week. We're just like I said at the beginning of the show, we're slinging the poutine thing at uh, my venue up here because we're still sort of we're slowly opening up in the phase three now. So I have a couple events coming up I'm excited to be doing, and um, I'm looking forward to training camp getting started, and NFL, NHL playoffs starting next weekend as well. So I'm excited to have some sports back on TV. So other than that, yeah. Good stuff. James? Did a uh, quick stroll of uh, Houday Nation from our uh, fan of the week, and as we alluded to at the beginning of the show, camps are starting um, up for the teams, which is great, and, and testing started. And unfortunately, it does look like one of the rookies um, was diagnosed as, as positive, which, you know, I think we're, we're going to see. Um, but uh, I didn't even read, I didn't read what it said. What I go, meant. Go, back, go back, go back to that other one. <laughs> yeah, that's good stuff, buddy. <laughs> I remember that run. 
Um, so anyways, well, I'm putting stuff up while you're chatting. Sorry, buddy. Yeah. It's losing my train of thought here, but, yeah. uh, the first positive test, which will happen, but you know, I think the NFL, uh, the Bengals, you know, are obviously have a plan for bringing everybody back, keeping everyone safe. We've seen the majority of, of other sports do it. I think there was something shared on um, social media. I'm not sure if it's true, but 10,000 MLB players tested six um were tested positive like four players and, and two personnel which is great um i think that's 0. 0.005 if my uh unc charlotte math is um correct so they're showing that it can be done hopefully um the nfl will continue with that as jamie said hockey's um coming back the nba's coming back so you know looking forward to it this is a, a step back in, in the right direction um as we talked about hopefully we'll be able to uh be in the in the stands and enjoy it and you know just um just ready back here in indiana um our little guy goes back to school this week so we're um summer's over basically for him um school starts back up we start early here uh, which is good for the kids and you know, and then that means football season's around the corner. So uh, that's what's going on here. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, just a couple quick updates. So our, our store that we have for the tailgates, uh, I think there's a lot of shirts up and masks and uh, a lot of koozies. We're getting a lot of messages about that. I, I want to be clear, guys, that, that that link is on the top of our um, page on Twitter and I think some of the other social media. I, I just want to be clear. We, we, we don't make a dime out of that, guys. We, we're not looking. We just had so many requests over the years, people just wanting those koozies. You come to the tailgate, you get a free koozie. We just have koozies. Um, but so many people wanted them. We wanted to make them available. And so we just added shirts and the mask and other things as well. So we don't make a dime on any of that. That is a straight just uh, getting you guys the the availability to, to order some shirts and some some koozies. Uh, also, uh, we uh, met uh, this past week, uh, James and myself and Craig and a lot of folks that are involved in facilitating our tailgate. So we uh, have formulated a plan for our tailgate that we'll probably be rolling out here uh, soon. But uh, we, we've, we have some plans. We've got a lot of stuff that we talked through trying to do something responsibly and so there'll be some more information come out. I know we get asked about that uh, constantly. Stay tuned. Uh, more more to come on that. We've got some actually really cool stuff uh, we've talked about, and we've got to finalize those plans. And once we do, uh, we'll get the messaging out to everybody. And finally, I, I would like to thank you guys. You don't know how much it means, you know, um, you know, us doing this, you know, by the fans, for the fans, uh, getting some some players on. We've got some. Uh, some old former players still lined up for the next few weeks. We have some uh, current players where well, we're trying to lock up some dates and times. Uh, we appreciate every, everybody tuning in and interacting with us on, on this uh, show. And it means a lot. It, it, it's, it's humbling for us to see all the folks that watch it live. And then all the, you know, the hundreds more that even watch the, the tape delay uh, on you know, Facebook or, or YouTube. We appreciate it. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday night. Who day? Thanks, everyone.